My name is Chris West, and welcome to this, the first in the series of videos on the Steinberg's Cubase program. This will introduce you to the program and the concept behind the sequencing package you're about to see. We'll be looking at a step-by-step -step guide through its functions, and also guide you through your very first session. Steinberg's philosophy is easy. It's one computer program on three different platforms, the Macintosh, the IBM PC compatible, and the Atari. There are four programs in the series, Cubase Lite, Cubase 2.5, Cubase Score, and Cubase Audio. Cubase Lite is an entry-level sequencer offering 16 tracks, editing, scoring, and printing. The Cubase 2.5 version is the full program with the exception of printing and page layout, and of course, the audio facility. Cubase Score has all the functions of 2.5 with the ability to page layout, desktop publishing and printing. Cubase Audio is at the top of the range. It has all the facilities of Score with the extra ability to record direct-to-disc analog sound. Other than the programs, there's a whole host of additional hardware for Steinberg programs. This is the Midex Plus unit for the Atari ST. This will not only give you key expansion slots, four in this case, it will also give you four more MIDI outs and also the ability to have timecode synced to tape. This is a card for the IBM PC compatibles. This gives you MIDI in and out. Okay, this is the SMP2 unit. This will give you professional synchronization for the Atari and the PC computer. Not only will it give you sync to tape facilities, but also mergeable inputs and assignable four different MIDI outs, giving you a maximum of 64 MIDI channels. For the Macintosh, we have two interfaces. This is the Mac MIDI 1. This will give you MIDI in and three MIDI outs, and also gives you the ability to connect your printer and bypass the MIDI function. This is the Mac MIDI 2 interface. This uh, offers SMPTE timecode, MIDI timecode, as well as MIDI in, two MIDI ins, and three MIDI outs or six MIDI outs, featuring 32 MIDI channels, as well as through buttons for your printer and your modem ports. One day computers fall into three main areas, a keyboard, a monitor screen, and the actual computer itself. Inside the computer is the working engine and we have memory in there called RAM memory, random access memory. This is an area where your program will reside and work and all data will be stored. This data is volatile. Should the computer lose its power, this will be lost. So for that reason, we have data storage, for example, a floppy disk or maybe an internal hard drive. Let's look at the three different platforms for Cubase. First of all, the Atari computer. This is the Atari 1040 ST, and it's mouse driven as you can see, and it has an internal memory of one megabyte, and this will run Cubase. Secondly, let's look at the IBM PC compatibles. You will need at least two megabytes of internal RAM and a hard disk drive to store your program on. Because Cubase works in a window environment, you will need to run MS-DOS 5 and Microsoft Windows version 3.1. And thirdly, the Apple Macintosh. You will need at least two megabytes of RAM to run Cubase. This computer is an IBM PC compatible and it's a 386 processor. You will need at least a 386 or a 486 processor to run Cubase. The configuration of this computer is a four megabyte RAM and a hundred megabyte hard disk. Let's look at the way we install a disk protected Cubase program onto the hard drive. 
first thing we need to do is actually not talk to the internal C drive. We need to talk to the floppy disk drive. So I put the program in the computer and type in A colon and return key. And this will prompt the disk drive to be looked at. That's the A floppy disk drive. The next thing we need to do is to actually address the directory. So if we type in dir and return, this will give us a list of the directory. OK, we can see a choice of three programs, the Cubase, EXE, the install bat, and the readme first file. What we need to do is actually run the install bat. That's batch file. So by simply typing in install, space, the letter C, because this is the directory we want to actually put the program on, and a colon, and a backslash. And then we need to name a directory for this to be loaded into. We're going to call it Cubase. Now all we have to do is return file, and this will create a directory called Cubase on the hard drive. As you can see, the files have been created on the C hard drive inside the computer. We now have to enter Windows to complete the procedure. So we simply type in win, W-I-N, with a forward slash, and S for standard Windows procedure, standard mode. Return, Microsoft Windows version 3.1. The next job we need to do is to actually create a group window for Cubase. So this is easily done by under the option file menu we we'll click on there and the first item is new we want to click on that this brings up a, a special screen with two names in it program group and program item first of all we're going to use the program group to actually add our program into a window so by clicking on program group and OK in now we get a description title and we want of course to type in Cubase and then click OK again with the mouse. This has created a window called Cubase. And inside this window, we want to move the program and the MIDI setup. By simply going to File and New again, we have the program item. Simply click on OK. We have a new window open. This time, we'll go straight to Browse. What we're looking for is what's on our C drive. And under C, if we click there, we get a list of all the folders where uh, we're automatically loaded into from the floppy disk. And under Cubase, we double click there. And now, if you look to the window to the left, we have two files in there. One is the program, and the other one is the MIDI setup. By simply clicking on Cubase EXE and OK in, and we can OK again, we have created the icon in the window. Now, for MIDI purposes, we need to do the same again for the MIDI setup. So new. Program item, OK, and Browse, look into C drive again, and under Cubase file, the MIDI setup. Click on that, and OK it. OK again. This has created the Cubase program and the setup. We have one last thing to do before we can actually launch the program, and that is define what kind of MIDI interface under the MIDI setup. So by, so by double-clicking on the icon, it brings up a directory of user interfaces and in this case we're actually looking for the MPU type interface so we'll highlight that and OK it make it active and OK it and this will load that MIDI setup for your Cubase program and of course to simply launch the program we double click on Cubase this is the procedure for loading Cubase for Windows onto your hard drive programs such as Cubase Score for the PC will be key protected and the disk install will be done through the normal Windows application. This is an Apple Macintosh computer. This is a 2CX. It has a 4 megabyte RAM and a 40 megabyte hard drive. Programs that run on the Macintosh fall into two categories. They're either disk protected, that means the protection is on the disk and it has to be installed onto your hard drive, or it's key protected, as Atari programs are. Let's look at the two different ways that these are installed onto your computer. First of all, the disk protected procedure. The Macintosh has an icon based system just like the Atari and if I double click on this icon here this is the hard disk drive. If you're not used to double clicking keep trying it has to be very fast. We've opened a window here 
and inside this window we have a system folder. This is necessary for the Macintosh system to run. Our next stage is to open a empty folder within this window. And this is easily done by the following procedure. At the top of the screen you can see five titles and an Apple sign. Under these titles are what we call drop down menus and simply by placing the mouse over and clicking with the mouse and holding down you have drop down menus. Under one of these menus, under file, we have new folder. This is what we need to create a new folder with. And by releasing the mouse, we have a new folder icon with the words untitled folder. If you just type straight in now the word Cubase and click with the mouse, it has been retitled Cubase. And that's the symbol for a folder. The next thing we need to do is to actually install the disk by putting the disk into the disk drive. We place the disk in the disk drive and immediately on the screen, the right hand side, you'll see an icon saying program disk. Here it is. And by double clicking, we are going to see what's inside that disk. And you can see a new window that is activated and it's symbolized by these lines at the top where this one isn't activated because it's white. And inside we have a readme first file a Cubase program and a teach text program. What we need to do to install this disk protect procedure is to double click on Cubase 2.5. The next screen you will see is the install screen. And this enables us to either install onto the hard disk, and there are two installs on this disk, or even launch the master. This means you will be working off the floppy disk. For the purpose of this video, we're going to install it on our hard disk. I double click on install. The next screen is asking me exactly where do I want to put this program. And this is our empty file that we've actually renamed Cubase. So I'm going to click on there, double click, and install. The procedure now is the program is being installed into that empty folder. Okay, as you can see, it said it's completed, and it can take up to about 20 seconds depending on the speed of your computer. Now I'm going to quit out of this program, the install program, and move the program disk away so you can see where we've copied it into. And simply by double clicking on this folder, I'll open up the folder called Cubase, and as you can see, the Cubase program is inside. Now, that's not the end of the uh, operation. We have to actually copy the other two disks that come with the pack into this folder as well. So what I will do is, first of all, close this window by clicking there. And I will remove the disk from the drive by simply clicking on with the mouse and dragging this icon down to the wastebasket at the bottom. Release the mouse and the computer disk will be ejected. The next thing we need to do is to place in the next disk, which is Additional Files 1. If you place it into the computer, it will automatically come up on the right-hand side. And we need to open this by double-click again. And inside, you can see several items. And if I click on the bottom, I can actually open the whole window. I need to take these three items and put them into this folder. Uh, there's two ways I can do this. I can simply hold down the shift button on the keyboard and click once on each or I can actually click away from the icon and hold down and drag the mouse across the three files or there is a third way which is Apple key on the computer and A select all we need when they're selected to literally click on them and drag them into the window space of Cubase and release. This will copy all these files into the Cubase folder. The next job we need to do is the additional files 2. This is exactly the same procedure as 1. We close the additional files one window and once again take the disk away into the wastebasket and release. 
replacing the disk with disk number two will automatically come up on the desktop and once again we need to open that and I move the window away so I can see where I'm moving this once again either elastic band across the whole seven programs here and click and drag into the window space and release as long as the arrow is within the window all these programs will go into that space included on this disk are drum maps MIDI manager pages, mixer maps and the Fostex drivers once this has been copied in we can actually run our program from this Cubase folder so this completes the installing of a disk protected Cubase program Close your window, eject the disk and put these disks away for safekeeping in case your disk drive gets damaged. One other point you can do here is actually clean up the look of this by going to one of the, uh, the drop-down menus and looking for clean up window. Once I take the click off you see it actually moves all the icons into a space and makes it look tidy for when you open your program when you want to use it. Now let's look into how we install the key protected programs. You have to have the key inserted between the keyboard and the computer or in the case of a PowerBook in the ADB bus. Installing a key protected program is actually simpler. Uh, after you've installed the key between the keyboard and the computer which is in the manual you can have up to five keys in line. You simply put the program disk into the computer Double click on the program and it will open the window. There is several items here. One of them is a README first file, which if you double click on that, will actually give you uh, a read through instructions how to do this procedure. But we'll go straight to the installer and simply double click on installer. This is an automatic installer which actually will prompt you to do the following disk changes. Once this is loaded, it will request if I need to install and it will tell me where it's going to be installed onto. So simply click on install and what's happening now is the program disk is being copied onto the hard disk of the computer. And as you can see it mentions the program disk here and the additional files one disk. There's a set of three disks in Cubase score program and this will take between 15 to 25 seconds depending on the computer configuration you have. Now it's requested me to take out the program disk and put the additional files one in. When it sees that disk it automatically loads the files it needs. Okay it's requesting that I put the original program disk back in the drive. As you can see it's very simple and it tells you what has to do. Okay it says that it's successful and now you have to restart your Apple Mac computer. Okay the computer's booted up and I can open up the hard disk drive and see where it's installed my Cubase score program. It's created a folder automatically. Now, if you were clever, you'd have noticed I talked about two additional disks and only one was loaded in. So we have one other function to do, in to install the additional files too. By just simply putting the disk into the drive, it would automatically come up an icon over here saying additional files too. Double click on the icon, it would open a window. I move this window down. As you can see, there's a lot of additional mix and maps and other functions you may need. It's advisable to actually move these all into your Cubase score folder. And by the methods I said before, either by clicking individually and holding down the shift, or Apple key on the computer and the word letter A will select all. Simply by clicking on any one of the files and dragging it, you can go straight into the folder when it turns black and release. These items will be copied inside that folder.
Right, close the window. And once again, drag the disc into the waste basket. This doesn't erase the disc, as you might think, as an Atari would do. This actually is the procedure for ejecting discs on the Apple Macintosh. OK, that completes the install of a key protected disc on the Apple Macintosh. This is the Atari 1040 ST. And it has one megabyte internal RAM and no hard drive. We load the program via the floppy disk. When you buy your Cubase pack, you have three disks, one program disk and two additional file disks, and the key protector dongle. This plugs into the side of the computer, and the disks plug into the disk drive, of course. Let's look at the procedure of actually loading the program on the Atari. Cubase programs run on computers that have an icon system. And this is the desktop of an Atari. What we can see here is the black pointer for the mouse and icons such as this A floppy disk. I can easily click on this icon and it is selected by turning black. If I click away on the desktop, it clears. If I actually want to see what is in disk drive A, I can just double click on this icon. This has opened a window and shows me what is in floppy disk drive A. In this case, Cubase program disk. And as you can see, there's more icons here. This one here is a, called a folder, this one is a program type icon, and this is a file type icon. And you can easily just select any one of these by clicking once with the mouse. Now it's very simple to launch the program. What we have to do is double click on the program. If this is the first time you've seen the Cubase program screen, uh, you'll see a lot of data on there and it can look very confusing. So what I'd like to do for you is to strip back the program and build it up in elements. So we'll have a look at the screen as it boots from your master disk. So what we're left with after I've stripped away everything is the basic desktop. We're in the Cubase program now. and I just want to talk about the titles at the top of the page here. These are called drop-down menus. And if I move over them, you'll see a list of facilities drop down for us. Now, don't worry about what these are at the moment. I just want to show you how they work. I'm just moving the mouse over this. If this is a Macintosh computer, I'd have to actually hold the mouse and click a button down. Let's do the first thing. Let's show you the basic screen. This is the main screen, and I've stripped it back to be very simple. Basically, as you can see down the left-hand side are the different tracks, and I can actually go down the tracks one by one. And this side is the linear path we're going to record onto. I imagine this to be like a tape recorder with this position marker going across the tape and recording and leaving its data behind. This is now playing in real time. Now the numbers at the top represent bars. If it was a tape recorder, of course, we'd be talking in time scale, and I can actually convert this line into a time scale by clicking here. Now what you can see is 0, and then 0, and 6 seconds, 0, 12 seconds, hours, minutes, and seconds. And once again, this would run, as a tape recorder would, across the tape. I like to think of this line as the tape head laying the music down onto the tape. For an example of this, let me load a new file. Here we see the tracks laid out as they would be on the tape recorder. And when I run the my would-be head across the tracks, you can see the data would be recorded on different tracks. If this was a tape recorder, you would expect to actually play the tape recorder and, of course, at some point, drop in to record. As soon as I stop the tape recorder, I would leave behind an area of track recorded. This is the concept I like to look at when sequencing. So I can actually run my tape recorder back and play OK, this way I could choose another track and have a different sound. For example, this is track 9, it's selected, and I'm going to record in this way. So run the tape recorder back and play. I dropped into record. As 
stop again, and as you can see, this is the path the tape recorder is taking. Okay, if it was a tape recorder, of course, a group would be playing together and they would make their own time base. Because we're dealing with a computer and we have our bars and beats at the top, what we actually need is something to play against. We actually need a click, and we have that facility, of course. We have the metronome working with a high note at the beginning of the bar. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now this gives me something to actually play against. So what I'd like to do is erase what we've done already and start again. I can easily do that in the computer by selecting this part that I've recorded and by using the delete key on the keyboard, erase that. And I select this one by clicking on it with the left mouse and the delete key. At any one time, if I make a mistake when I've erased something with the delete key, I can actually use the undo key and restore that track. So delete and undo. OK, so now we have a metronome to work with. The next thing I like to do is actually give myself a start and end time. Uh, because we're based on bars and beats, I actually bring in a locator point. A tape recorder would have a locator point, and we'd say we'd record from, say, 10 seconds. With a computer-based system, you can work with bars and beats. So simply by clicking with the left mouse button under the number, I can bring in a locator. And this line down here represents the start of bar 5. And by using the right-hand mouse button, I can bring in another locator at bar 9, the right locator point. This will give me an automatic start and finish point. So select the track I want to work on and simply go into record. We have two bars counting. And as you can see, I've actually recorded a result. Let's play that back. Let's look at another track. We'll go back to our percussion track on track 9 and listen to another recording. And I'll play that back. I'm fairly happy with my result. There's just one problem. It's all out of time. Now, the computer has the ability to actually put your performance into time. And uh, we won't go into the reasons why, but I'll just do it. I'm going to select both parts by holding down the Shift key on the computer and clicking on both tracks. These are now both selected. And simply by pressing Q on the computer, it automatically has quantized my result. Let's have a listen to that. OK, we can actually do this as we record it. And uh, I'm going to try and record some drums now on track 10. And I'm going to use a function over to the top right-hand side of the screen called Automatic Quantize. By clicking on to the letters AQ for Automatic Quantize and it going dark, it's now selected. What this will achieve for us is, as I record, it will actually put my performance into time. Let's record some drums. Okay, by the automatic quantize facility, this made me sound quite tight, and this is what we actually need. Now, so far, you've seen me magically drop in to record and stop and start. If it was a tape recorder, of course, we'd have a remote, and we have the same thing on the computer. We call it a transport bar. Under the menu, Windows, we have a title called Show Transport. Let's click on that. So you can see at the bottom of the screen, we have the transport section. And we're going to first of all look at this center part here. And as you can see, we have a play icon, and we have a stop icon, and we have rewind and forward. 
And this last one is our record icon. So I can play our result here. At any moment, stop. So if I was going to record, select a track, in this case track 4, it's going to be some strings, and using the record button will give me two bars counting before I go into record. As you see, when it got to the right locator point, it automatically dropped out. The stop button has uh, two or three functions other than just stopping from playing. If I stop twice, it goes to the left locator point, and stop three times goes to the beginning of the whole track. To the left of the transport controls, we have the left locator position. Uh, we positioned it with the mouse at bar 5, and there's the number there, and the right locator at bar 9. These can be changed very easily by just clicking on the left and right mouse to go down and up. So to decrease left mouse to increase right mouse. These other numbers here, this is the bar number, this is the beat number, and in one bar we're looking at four beats to the bar. The next number will be bar six, beat one. And the last number is the quantize per beat, and with Cubase we can go up to three, eight, three, and then it goes back to zero. Moving to the other side of the transport bar, we have the song position marker. This is bar, beat, and quantize. And if I should play, you'll see it scroll around bar 2, bar 3. You should also notice below this we have the relative time position. As a tape recorder would have time location, we have the very similar thing in Cubase. Except this time it's called Simpty Time. Uh, this stands for the Society of Motion Pictures and Television Engineers Standard Code. And this is used in video making, TV, and also music production. Uh, it's, a, it's a normal clock, and if I go back to the beginning I can show you. This is one hour, this is one hour, one minute, this is one hour, one minute, and one second. And at the end we have the frames. In America we have 30 frames per second. In England we use the European Broadcast Union Standard, which is 25 frames. So just to prove the point, one minute less than one hour would be 59 minutes. One second less than one hour would be 59 minutes, 59 seconds. To write of these two, we have the time signature. In this case, we're talking 4-4, and uh, you'll hear the click at 4-4. But this could easily be 6-8. Let's play that. And there's six beats to the bar. If you're really adventurous, maybe 7-8. And below that, we have the tempo. And I can play the track, and I can speed it up by clicking with the right mouse now. And with the left mouse, come back down again. This is beats per minute. And as you can see, we're on 120 beats per minute. And there's a three-digit display where you can get really fine tuning, down to a thousandth of a beat. Further right to the time signature are two boxes. This is I and this is O. And this stands for the MIDI data coming in and MIDI data going out. If I play a note on the keyboard, you can see the MIDI. And as I take the key off, MIDI data is sent for note off. To the right of that, we have the click. No click. Click is highlighted and thus activated. At the very bottom we have sync. This is used for synchronizing to tape. We're back to the full screen now. Uh, you will notice I've purposely left some details out on the transport bar. Uh, we're going to build it up as we actually need these facilities. So now we understand the system of locators, how we can actually change them. And If I change down here you'll see the left locator moving backwards across the screen and forward. So I can actually move this by numbers, say right up to bar 9 and if I move the right locator forward to say bar 13 I can actually record now in this new section I've selected the first track and I'm going to record from bar 9 to 13 let's put it into record and we'll get two bars counting
automatically it's dropped out for me. Let's hear what we've done. Okay, let's scroll back again. Now, the first section that we can play. Okay, I'll stop there. Obviously, I just have the piano. Now, I have the possibility of actually going to track 10 and recording my drums again in the same area between bars 9 and 13. Or I have the option to actually copy. Copying is done very simply in Cubase. If I click on this part that we've recorded, I can actually move it around the screen very easily. I could move it to that section, but then I wouldn't have it on this section. So what I actually need to do is copy. Copy on Cubase is done like this. You select the part, hold down the alternate key on the keyboard, and then click with the left mouse and drag away and position it where you want on bar 9. This has effectively copied all the data from there and added it to there. Let's hear our result. Okay, now we're not limited in these locator points. I can record from the beginning of the song to the end of the song. And to give an example of that, I'm going to move the locator point back to bar 5 again and leave the right locator at 13. And actually record on track 2 now, where we have a bass sound. So this time I have a part that's from bar 5 to bar 13. And by clicking magically on 1 on the keyboard, I can actually relocate back to the left locator. Play. Already we built up three or four tracks. Okay, let's introduce one more factor now, and it's down the bottom left-hand side, and it's called cycle. What cycle stands for is uh, the ability to cycle between these two locator points. This is a great effect when recording because you can keep the computer running. So let's go back to the main screen. So I'm going to move my left locator point by clicking with the left mouse button to 9. Now I'm going to build up some more tracks. I'm going to go to, say, track 3, where I've got a brassy sound. And this time when I'm in record, it would actually loop around this cycle. This means I can keep the computer in record and actually change tracks and build up a, a, a section very fast. Let's, let's do it. stopping, select another track.
see, without coming out of record, we've just been in cycle mode and we've been recording round. Let's hear it from the very beginning. Move the position marker back and play. You can see how fast you can build up sections in this way. Moving right back to the far left of the main screen, I want you to notice what we call the activity bars. As it plays, the activity is represented in this graphic form. Another facility that's available to you is the split screen. As I move the mouse over this, you see a hand produced, and if I click on it, I can actually pull this back. This introduces a new column called M. This is our mute. We can actually click on here and mute these individual tracks. Let's show you what that sounds like. It's just the drums and some percussion. And bring the piano in. We have a solo button. When this is depressed, this solos the particular track that's highlighted. So for example, track 9 is soloed, or I can select track 10, which is the drums of course. Release solo. We have the facility to actually name these tracks in place of track 1 to 10, I can actually say the, the instrument being played simply by double clicking on the name and we have a box and with the back space I can actually backspace the name out and input the name of what I want to say is on that track. And I'll do this one, this is our bass, double click. I can use the escape key to clear the whole area and just simply put in my name and I'll do one more down the bottom track 10 which is my drum track okay let's name the others now I've named all the parts it's very easy to see what sounds are where and uh, just to show you one other event by putting the left and right locator and I'm on the drum track this is highlighted this means it's going to go into record between the left and right locator you will see if I do some recording I'm going to do a count in This time I have an intro, and you will see that automatically this part has been named after the title of the track. So you won't have these track 1, 2, 3, up to 10, you have the actual names of the parts. This helps when you're cutting and splicing. It's worth mentioning at this point um, we still have the auto quantize on, and even if I played this out of time, the computer has put it in time for me. Let's move on to another area. This is going to be the toolbox. By clicking with the right mouse button, the toolbox will come up. So this is the toolbox, and by keeping the right mouse down, I can actually select any one of these tools. And we'll be showing you what the functions are of some of these tools. For example, if I release the mouse on the scissors icon, as you can see, the mouse becomes the scissors. OK, for this example, let's have a look at the magnifying glass and what that does for us. The magnifying glass can be used as what we call a scrub tool. This is a wonderful tool. I can actually click on here with the left mouse and you can see the MIDI data recorded on this track. If I move backwards and forwards, you actually hear the parts recorded in there. And on this one. And I'll move up to the top and show you the bass. This is very handy to see what's actually on a track. Strings and percussion. Let's go back to the toolbox now. Select with the right mouse and the toolbox comes up. 
Release again, I'm back to my pointer. Let's look at one of the other items here. This one here, this is the rubber eraser, and with this we can actually wipe tracks out. Let's wipe this one out. Simply by click, clicking on with the left mouse, that's disappeared. And if I want to undo that function with the keyboard, it will come back again. So let's wipe some of these tracks away. Let's look at another function on the toolbox, the pencil. Pencil is used on many screens, but in this screen we can use it for actually extending tracks. With the pencil I can actually extend any one of these parts, so just by clicking on the end of the part I can actually draw it and make it, for this example, a bar longer. Back to the toolbox with the right mouse and let me select the scissors. The scissors is literally for cutting parts up. In this case I can go to here and click and cut that into two sections. If I move back to the pointer under the toolbox, I can click and move that about anywhere on the track. I can erase it by pressing delete on the keyboard. Let's look at one more function on the toolbox and that's the mute function. Release the mouse and I have an X. And if I play from the beginning I can show you how this mute function actually mutes different tracks. Let's play from the left locator. Okay, if I want to stop the bass, piano, percussion, drums out. The advantage of using this mute, of course, over the overall track mute is that you're just muting individual parts and unmuting. And this can be used for different arrangements, for making different verses and bringing in different instruments without actually erasing the data, because you may change your mind at some point and actually want to bring this back in again. Now let's look what's the next column behind the screen, so to speak. And if we pull this back and let go, we'll actually see channels. These stand for MIDI channels. These are our MIDI channels going from 1 to 10. Now, obviously, you're using a MIDI keyboard to record your data. I'd just like to say a few words about MIDI. Um, I've always had a, a vision of how MIDI works. If you're confused about MIDI, I liken it to TV channels. For example, um, in your TV, down the aerial comes all the channels available to you. But because you select BBC One or BBC Two or ITV, uh, you actually tune that television into receiving that channel only. A MIDI is very much like that. If you select a MIDI channel here, it will broadcast only on that channel, and the instrument, in this case a piano, will receive the data on the track and play back that part and ignore all the other MIDI channels. So to use this MIDI channel facility, it means that we're not limited how many tracks we can actually send to the same MIDI channel. For example, if I want to make another drum track, I simply double click in this area and automatically I get a track 11 and I can change this number from MIDI channel 11 to 10. Now both these, these two tracks are talking to the same MIDI device. In this case it's our drums. So I might like to rename that drums and in this case I have two tracks of drums. So I could maybe call it drums 2. The reason for this is I might want to record some cymbals or tom-toms along with the drums I've already recorded. Do remember that this virtual tracks down this way can go up to 64 tracks with Cubase. MIDI is a system that goes up to 16 different channels. And with the aid of some of the hardware devices we showed you at the beginning of the video, you can actually expand that, 32 MIDI channels or even 64 MIDI channels using the Steinberg's SMP2 module. So to follow on, I'm going to put uh, our drums back to MIDI channel 10 because that's the unit, that's the MIDI channel the unit is listening to to play my drums. And uh, for example, I can underline this by adding extra tracks. You add an extra track by double clicking in this area. Automatically, you can see track 11. And if I double click, track 12 and maybe track 13. Now what I would like to do is add some more drums, some tom-tom fills maybe. So I can rename this by the double click and escape method used before and put uh, drums 2 in there and rename this one.
This one drums four. Now my problem is that uh, drums two, three and four are talking to different MIDI channels. I actually just want to talk to the device listening on MIDI channel 10. So simply with the left mouse click and take these numbers down. Or you can actually double click in that box and type in a number and return. So now I have three more tracks all talking to the same device. So let's highlight this one because this is the track I want to record on and do some more drums. going to record. Let's play back what I've done. If you're not sure what you've done, you can easily solo it using the solo button down the bottom. Here's my Tom Tom fill and play it back with all the drums in. Okay, let's add one more part, drums. This time I'm going to use another snare drum. Okay, let's play that back. With this method I can build up my drum tracks. If I was programming this on a session, I suppose I would dedicate one track to my bass drum, one track to my snare drum, one track to hi-hats, tom-toms, etc, etc. This way I can actually mute passages and bring them in as I choose throughout the song. Let's look at another function that's hidden underneath the hand. I'm going to draw it back and show you a column called instrument. This is a device to actually tell you, we know we're talking about drums, but what instrument are we talking to? And by simply double-clicking on this line, I can actually give it an instrument. In this case, we're using Mac IS 1000. Now, as soon as I return this, not only will it tell me that the S1000 is listening on MIDI channel 10, but it'll also add it to the other tracks. This tells me that all these other tracks, because they're broadcasting on MIDI channel 10, are going to the S1000. Let's name up some of the other instruments. At the top of the screen, we have the piano playing on a DX7. Now this time when I've returned, this is the only instrument broadcasting on MIDI channel 1, so this is the only instrument talking to the DX7. If I should change this channel to 1, you'll see DX7 come up. OK, let's name some other instruments here. Channel 4, we have the Proteus Emu. This has an added function. If I select a new track, I can actually go to the instrument area and click on, and a menu will pop up with all my instruments I have available to me. And I can select one of these by releasing. This not only tells me what instrument I'm talking to, it would automatically set the MIDI channel to that device. Now we're going to look at uh, another facility hiding underneath the hand. Uh, believe me, this does stop somewhere, but for now, we'll just show you this next column. This is called Output. At the moment, we've been using the in and out of the Atari MIDI connection. But uh, we have other devices that we talked about at the beginning of the video, the MIDX Plus and the SMP device. If I click on this output, I get a scroll of list of choices, and I can choose any one of the SMP outputs. And if you remember from the beginning, I, I said that any one of these outputs has 16 MIDI channels on it. Thus, you can get 64 MIDI channels at the same time. MIDX output, 1, 2, 3, and 4. OK, I have one more column to show you. And it's the track defined. These all defined to MIDI tracks because we're recording MIDI data, but we do have other devices under here. If I click on one of these tracks, I have MIDI track, a drum track, a group track, a tape track, that's for Fostex a synchronization and dropping in and out a record, and a mix track, which uses a device called MIDI Mixer inside. We won't go into these at the moment, but just to show you, they are there and selectable. For example, the percussion could be put to a drum track, transformed to drum parts, yes, and all the percussion we've recorded can be now edited in one of the edit screens that we'll be talking about in part two.
Now, the other advantage we have here is we can actually move these around. If I want to move this to any format that I like to work in. And uh, what we're looking to now is to get back to the original screen you saw at the beginning of the video. And you would find it would look something like this. Of course, you can close this down as far as you like to see more of the actual track working space. And whilst I'm talking about the actual working space of the track, let me just home in on two other areas we haven't talked about yet. And that's these scroll bars at the top and bottom and at the side here. Simply by clicking on the left mouse, I can actually scroll through the song, and you can actually see the scroll bar at the bottom moving along and the track slowly going out of picture. I can actually click on the scroll bar and move that, and it instantly will jump back to the beginning of the track. I have another function with the scroll bars. Using the right mouse this time, I can actually make the bars go closer together so I can actually see more of the song. Now, as you can see, we're going from bar 1 right up to bar 33 on our screen, and this will go right down to about, depending on what tempo you're talking about, but as you can see, 240 bars. I think that's enough for anybody. The other end of this scroll bar, if I click with the right mouse again, it will actually expand it. And you have the same facility with the up and down mouse. I can actually go, that's fully that way. And the same with this. I can actually squeeze all the tracks down. So if I had 64 tracks this way, I could actually squeeze them all down and expand them. I click on the arrow with the right mouse button. There we have it. Make it really big. This may be useful when you're using the toolbox and uh, you're actually using the scrubber device. Gives you a closer zoom in facility. So to get back to the screen you saw at the beginning when I loaded the program, we have one more thing to show you and it's called the inspector. So under this icon in the bottom left hand corner, I click with the left mouse and what we get a whole information pack on whatever we highlighted. So if it's uh, the drum track or the bass track or the piano track, you see the names changing in the boxes here. So let me click on this one. This is the melody track. This is information all about this track and it tells me the instrument, the output, the MIDI channel and loads of other functions. Let me just play the computer. Under program, I can actually change the sound. So I can double click, actually type in a program volume. I can actually change the volume in real time. Or transpose. These are all real-time functions. And if I'm talking to a part, it will change, and the information will tell me this part is called the melody intro, and it's on the instrument, and I can change the actual transpose of this part rather than the whole track. OK, so whatever we select, a drum track, it will give me that information. This way, you can actually change from section to section and choose a new program or velocity or maybe a delay. It would even do minus delays for lazy drums or lazy sounds, string sounds. OK, let's go into part two now and actually start from this blank screen and do our first session together. We're going to now do our first session and you can either work with me step by step or just watch the video and work on your computer later. This is the main screen as it loads from uh, stand in and it's called the default arrangement and it's up there and this can be changed and personalized to your own use but uh, let's for the purpose of this let's make sure it's going to react the way I want it to react my first job is to make sure that the metronome is going to give me my counting that I like to work with and by double clicking on click a central box will come up a thousand different users of Cubase will use in a thousand different ways. But I like to use with the MIDI click off because I have the metronome in the computer to guide me. I like to work with the pre-roll on as well. This will give me two bars running on the sequencer before it goes into record. OK, now I'm happy with that. I can actually OK that. I also like to work with the inspector closed down. The main reason for this is I can look into that later. It gives me more space on the screen to see my song. 
I would like to work with my automatic quantize on and I like to work in punch mode. You have choice of three here. You have mix, punch and normal. I'll explain the difference. Mix will mix the data as it cycles round and punch will automatically go into record. So if I make a mistake at the end of the bar, next time round when I play it will automatically punch in. Or normal will record first time and then stop. So I've selected punch. Further to this I like to use the cycle mode to record and I also like to always start at bar 3. This is in case for some reason I need an intro uh, before the counting. The other factor I want to change is these tracks from 1 to 16. I want to actually put in the sounds that I'm going to deal with and the MIDI channels and its device outputs. Let's check how it comes with the boot up program. There's the instrument section which is blank because we haven't customized it yet and there's the output section which is talking to the Atari. Of course if you have one of the MIDI devices to actually select them and that would be your output device. First thing to do is actually name the tracks that you want to use and I'm going to start customizing it to what I want to see. And you can name these tracks in any order that you like. So I'm going to go straight to my default setup. So I've named the titles that I want to work with and I have one other function to do because I'm going to work in cycle mode. I want to actually, rather than overdub, I want to replace. This uh, links up with the punch facility I've used up here. The idea is that uh, as it cycles round, if I make a mistake, I can actually just start playing at any one point and it will go into record. You'll find this a very fast way to work. So what do I need? Bar 3, left locator, to bar 5, and I'm going to select my hi-hat track because I want to do a counting. Let's do the first recording now. As you can hear, it's cycling round, and that's my counting. I'm happy with that, so I don't have to do anything else. Stop the computer. You can either stop the computer using there, or I'm using the space bar, or zero on the keyboard. Next thing I need to do is to build up a basic bass drum pattern. So I'm going to use the next four bars for this. So I'm going to move my right locator, right mouse, and my left locator, left mouse. And I'm on the kick track now. Let's just record this. <laughs> 